Well, I mentioned in the last chapter that we would be starting our studies of human biology on the very small scale, and then we would work our way up um, gradually throughout the semester until we're talking about organs and organ systems. Um, so today we're going to be getting going on that very, very small scale. We're going to start off talking about chemistry. This chapter is all about chemistry, chapter two. And if you haven't had a lot of chemistry in your background, let's just start with the basic definition. What is chemistry? So chemistry is the study of matter and energy. Matter is basically the stuff around you, the stuff that has some mass. Um, and energy is the ability to do work. So it's the ability to do something with that matter, change it in some way, move it around, um, make some changes to it. So matter, all of the stuff around you, things like physical objects, um, and also tiny little particles in the air that you breathe, okay, all of that's matter. Um, matter is made up of things called elements. And elements come in different varieties. I'm sure you're familiar with elements, even if you haven't been calling them elements before. Um, examples of elements would include things like aluminum, um, gold, oxygen, all of these are different types of chemical elements and they each have their own unique properties. Each one behaves a little bit differently. So chemists like to arrange elements according to their properties, according to how they behave, how they interact with each other, and they are arranged on a periodic table. This is what a periodic table looks like. This is called periodic table of the elements. And each element is represented by one of these little boxes. Each element has its own symbol, like right here is hydrogen. It's just represented with a capital H. And then you'll notice there are some other numbers on the periodic table as well. And those numbers are telling us information about the different elements. Okay, so let's just imagine um, something familiar. Let's go to our list here. Let's imagine aluminum, like an aluminum can maybe. Okay, so aluminum, um, it's possible to take that chunk of aluminum and break it into smaller and smaller pieces, right? If we break it down as small as we possibly can, uh, the tiniest little bit of that element, aluminum, would be called an atom. That's the tiniest amount that we're able to physically separate and still have it retain the normal properties of aluminum. So we'll be talking a lot about atoms in this chapter. Atoms are like the very tiniest little building blocks that matter is made of. So we could talk about an atom of aluminum, or we could talk about an atom of um, iron or an atom of oxygen. An atom is just referring to that tiniest little bit. All right, so atoms, let's focus in on atoms. Atoms have a particular structure to them. They all have a few things in common in terms of organization. Atoms all have protons at the middle at the very center of the atom would be protons. And protons are the things that are positively charged. So in chemistry, you've probably heard of positives and negatives, positive charges and negative charges. Uh, protons are the things that are positively charged. And the protons, the number of protons, is what determines which type of element we're talking about. So let me just go back for a second to the previous slide. Let's look at this periodic table again. Okay, notice the numbers on the periodic table right here above hydrogen is a number one. This is telling us that hydrogen has one proton. If we jump over here, we have helium. It has two protons. So this number up above um, the atomic symbol is telling us literally how many protons are there in this particular type of element. Um, okay, so that's essentially that's how elements are arranged on the periodic table is according to how many protons they have inside. Okay, so protons are positively charged. The number of protons is referred to as the atomic number. You'll want to know that. Another thing that we have inside of an atom is something called a neutron or maybe multiple neutrons. These are other particles that are neutral. They are not charged positively or negatively. They're just kind of neutral and that's why they're called neutrons. And they hang out at the center of the atom um, with the protons. Neutrons give a certain amount of mass. They increase the mass of the atom. So the more neutrons you have, the heavier the atom will be. 
And it's possible, with a given element, it's possible to have like different versions. Some will have maybe just a few neutrons, others will have more neutrons. Um, and the name for those different varieties is isotopes. We can have different isotopes of a given element and they're going to weigh different amounts. They'll have a different atomic mass. So the mass of an atom, pretty much it comes from just the protons and the neutrons. Those are the two primary particles that contribute to mass. Uh, we also have one other type of little particle though, and that's the electron. Very important particle, but it's a lot tinier. It doesn't have as much mass, so it doesn't contribute very much to the weight of an atom. And, <clears throat> excuse me, just in terms of arrangement of all of this stuff, let's take a look at the the schematics that are down here at the bottom in this figure. So right here we're looking at one hydrogen atom. It has just one proton in its center. Hydrogen, as it turns out, often doesn't have any neutrons. So that's why we don't see anything else in the center. But then around that center, there is this cloud of, um, this blue cloud is what it looks like, and that's a region where an electron might be found. So the electrons tend to be around the center of the atom, they sort of orbit, and that's called an electron cloud. We say that there are shells surrounding the nucleus, those shells are regions where electrons might be found. Uh, let's jump over to this other one, this is an oxygen atom, and so we can see in the center, which by the way, is called the nucleus of the atom. Okay, the nucleus, that's like the central core. In the nucleus we have the protons, positively charged, and some neutrons, which are neutral, no charge. Okay, so that's the nucleus right here. And then let's take a look at these shells, electron shells. Okay, notice right here um, is one shell that has a couple of electrons in it. And then there's another shell. If we jump out to here, here's another shell around this oxygen um, atom. And so that, those are shells where the electrons tend to hang out. So um, something that you might have heard about before is that opposites attract, right? Positives are attracted to negatives and vice versa. And so uh, the fact that there are positives in the center of the atom that helps to attract the electrons and kind of keep them close by in those shells. One other thing to know about these electron shells, and this is going to come up a little bit later in this chapter, um, each shell can hold a certain number of electrons. The innermost shell that an atom has always can hold up to two electrons. That's kind of the general rule. So I'm just going to put a little note over here on the side regarding these shells. Um, the first shell can hold up to two electrons. The symbol for electron is E with a little negative because they're negatively charged. Okay, so it can hold two electrons. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. We're going to see this later on. Um, the third shell also can hold up to eight electrons. Those are kind of like the limits in terms of how many they can hold. So we'll come back to that fact again later on. Ordinarily, for a given atom, if it's just hanging out by itself, ordinarily the number of protons is balanced by the number of electrons. So the number of positive charges is the same as the number of negative charges. And so we would say that overall the atom is uncharged, or we could say that it's electrically neutral. There's no particular charge to it. Um, if there's an imbalance of those two, like if there are more protons than electrons, maybe one of the electrons got pulled off somehow, then we would say that we're talking about an ion. Okay, so ordinarily, let me just see if I can note this somehow. Um, I'll just put a note up, up in the top here. Ordinarily, ordinarily, the number of protons equals the number of electrons in an atom. Okay, but if that's not the case, um, if number of electrons does not equal the number of protons, so they are not the same, 
Then we're talking about an ion. Instead of calling it an atom, then, oop, let's see here. Then we're talking about an ion instead of an atom. Okay, so we'll be talking about ions as we go forward in the course. There will be a number of ions that are very biologically relevant. And now you know an ion is just going to be a charged thing, a charged um, little particle. Okay, so let's see here. Let's focus in a little bit more on isotopes for a moment. So isotopes, these are like different varieties of a given element. And remember what's different about different isotopes? They just have a different number of neutrons. So going on to the next slide here, isotopes. The way that different isotopes can be denoted is with a superscript just above and to the left of the atomic symbol. Um, so for example, with carbon, if I just go back to the periodic table for a second here, we will see that carbon, here it is, carbon has six protons. This other number right below the atomic symbol, that's telling us the atomic mass. So the mass of carbon is about 12. Um, so if we've got six protons, and then we have some number of neutrons, and the total mass is 12, that means we must have six neutrons in kind of like an average um, carbon. Okay, so six protons, six protons, and six neutrons gives us an average mass of about 12. That's how that's calculated. Okay, so anyway, um, an average normal carbon atom has six protons and six neutrons. Let's go back to our isotope slide. Okay, so ordinarily, an average carbon would be symbolized like so. We'd put um, just the, the atomic symbol and then the number 12. That's kind of like its normal mass that it would have. It's possible for carbons to have more neutrons so if we add two more neutrons, then what's going to happen to the mass? It's going to increase. It's going to increase to 14. So right here, this is an example of an isotope for carbon. Carbon-14 is how we would refer to that, versus carbon-12 is kind of like the, the typical carbon. So different isotopes of atoms can be useful for different things. There are some isotopes that are radioactive, and ordinarily, probably when we hear that word radioactive, we think, oh, that's not a good thing. Like that can be very dangerous. That can be very damaging to, to living things. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, it, it can also be a useful tool. We actually use radiation for a lot of um, beneficial things, actually. So just to give a few examples, certain types of imaging techniques, like medical imaging techniques, actually rely on radioactive isotopes of atoms. And the energy that radioactive isotopes give off, the energy is something that can help us to visualize different things that are going on in the body. Um, it can also be useful for cancer treatment, so actually targeting that energy to specific regions of the body in order to kill off cancer cells, that's another very useful application. Different isotopes, radioisotopes, are used in many different dating uh, techniques, dating of fossils, trying to determine ages of things and different, um, different rock layers. Um, we also use it for power supplies. So this is, I thought was a particularly interesting example for our class, cardiac pacemakers that can be implanted over the heart to help control the, the rate of beating, the pacing of the heart. Um, how are they powered, right? It's not like they're plugged in all the time. They're actually powered but through the use of radioisotopes. Again, radioisotopes give off a certain amount of energy over time, and that energy can be used to do, to do things. So um, radiation is not always a terrible thing. It depends on what we're doing with it. It is important to avoid overexposure to radiation, and this is why it's important to wear like, sunscreen, for example. When you go out in the sun, the radiation from the sun can be very damaging, can damage our DNA. So we'll be talking about that later on in the semester. But anyway, for right now, um, this is all in the context of isotopes. Different isotopes exist and they can be used for different things.